That's no more. That's an asshole. It wasn't a phase. Back to the Senior Citizen Podcast. We are here with someone who I have to start off with a huge congratulations to for I don't know how many streams it is anymore. Anna <laughs> Eclipse. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I am great. How many streams is it on Unholy now? Um, I checked yesterday. I think it's a um, thousand. No, sorry, a thousand. Uh, a million, two hundred thousand, and seventeen. That's think. insane. It's unreal. <laughs> And I, I love your promos for it. Basically, female bad omens. Like, I see them on TikTok all the time. But it, it, that's incredible. Like, a million streams. Holy crap. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's something unreal that I never thought I'd achieve, especially, like, during my first year of this project alone. I always thought this would come maybe, like, a couple years down the line. Like, I never thought it would be my first single either. <laughs> like, right. It's crazy because, like, everybody says all the time, like, oh, I don't know why this song blew up. And... I never really thought about that until it happened to me. Right. And um, it's, it's really neat to see that people love the song. And it's crazy because it was my first song that I've ever put out. So it means the absolute world to me that people enjoy it. And I think it was just a mixture of like everything working out at once. Like obviously it's a very good song, but also with like all the Bad Omens hype. And it does have that vibe to it. And that kind of style of music is probably becoming a little bit more mainstream, yes. I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm glad it happened to you. I'm glad it happens to, to local artists, to people who don't have, you know, a million dollars to put into marketing and, you know, and studio times and whatnot. So Definitely. I want to hear about you. It's your first year as, you know, Anna Eclipse yes. for this project. Uh, how'd you get into music, creating music? What's your background? Um, from a super young age, I was into music. My parents, none of them were mus musicians, but like I, I grew up around like a versatile mix of music. My dad, like country, rap all of this different type of stuff. My mom was more like the grunge, grungy Nirvana um, type of girl. So I was always around different types of music and I think that's kind of what shaped my love for all these different types of music. And it's kind of how I created on Eclipse because I put a bunch of different genres together <laughs> and that's how I created my project. But um, a little bit about me is I was in local bands when I was a teenager in my area and it was really cool. Um, I was also in my local school of rock and I really enjoyed that. So that also played a key role in my love for music. I have a ton of just teachers and mentors at school of rock that have really helped um, shape my love for music as well. Um, so I wouldn't be the same without those people. Uh, shout out to Rocky and Rustin, you guys are great. Um, and Scott, Scott, you were like the best guitar instructor I've ever had. Um, but yes, um, School of Rock when I was younger. And then I basically got into local bands. Um, my first band when I was 16, 17. And then um, that was more like uh, like a pop rock-ish type band. And okay. then I moved into kind of like an indie alternative band like a couple years later. Right. And as time went on, I don't know. I don't want to say that I'm hard to work with, but I'm just kind of the person that just likes to have my hands in everything. And I really thought maybe having a solo product would be the best thing for me. Right. Because I produce everything myself, I write everything myself, and it's just, I really like having um, control over my art. It's just me as a person. Right. So I was, I want to say, yeah, last year. Um, it's funny because I took a break from music because I was working two jobs. And you know how that gets. Oh, you know? yeah, no. And I think I've worked like three jobs at one time before. Really? Like, yeah, no. <laughs> so you get it, you get it. So um, I actually, um, I was working at a pizza place on a bakery and the owner of the bakery, like I was really into baking back then and I was really good at it. And she gave me the opportunity to own the bakery. So I thought that's what I was doing. So I just gave up on music completely oh, wow. for a couple of years. So I was gearing up towards owning this bakery and it just, the deal fell through. So I was unemployed for a little bit. That's so out of left field. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because like, I, I guess that's probably what happened to you too. Like, okay, you like baking and it's cool or whatever. But since you were working with it, it was like, it absorbed you. Yes. And that's why you were like, yeah, I'm going to own this bakery. Because I worked at a tutoring center. Yeah. And they're like a franchise or whatever. And the owner was like, hey, listen, you know, I want to open up another one. You can manage it. I'll open up it up for you. But you run the whole thing. And I'm like... Yeah, I mean, it's money. Like, let, let's let's do it. Sure, I'll, I'll teach more kids. And then, Definitely. like in retrospect, right now, I'm like, I could never 
Like, I know. You know, the kids in the math program did better math than I ever did. <laughs> like, <laughs> how would that have worked? But it's, it's, it's crazy, too, because, like, it just seems like when you're so engrossed in something else, especially very time consuming, you forget about your true passions, like what you really want to pursue, and you kind of put them on the sidelines. So that's what I did. And um, when that deal fell through, like, I was really upset. But then I found another job a couple months later. Um, and because I also did marketing for her, so I was able to land a marketing job and I needed a good computer for marketing. And it just so happened that like I needed that computer now or else that they were not going to hire me. So I went to Best Buy and the only computers they had were like MacBooks and the more expensive ones. I had, I had like no choice but to get a MacBook. So like, oh cool, like I could do music production on this, like just like as a hobby, like if I have some time. So I ended up getting a MacBook. And then um, it's funny because I needed that MacBook for work. Like it was destiny, really. Right. So I produced Unholy like that same week. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, like last year. And I'm like, oh, this is really, really cool. Um, why don't I just put it out and see what happens? Like, right. I didn't expect any hype at all. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened was I produced Unholy. I contacted this guy I found online. He's really good. His name is Louis Little Green. He lives in Italy. He's an amazing producer. He's actually helped me produce basically everything I've ever written um, for Ani Eclipse. So a shout out to him as well. He's amazing for production work. Um, so basically I gave him that full demo. He just did his own little thing with it, put the embellishments on. I mean, it was still like my idea, but you know how it is. He yeah. basically just did the guitars and bass and drums, all that tracking and put Unholy together. And then I recorded vocals for that, had it mixed and mastered, all that. Um, I put it out in November of last year, and it didn't start picking up traction until, like, I want to say July of, um, of last year. Oh, no, sorry. I have my time frame You mixed put it up. in... Jo uh, November of 2022. It's crazy. I don't... I can't comprehend that it's 2024 already. I don't Me know. Me neither. Somebody was like, oh, I've been in, in the band for, like, four years since 2019. And I'm like, <laughs> wait. <laughs> four years ago was still 2019? But, um, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing how that blew up and how, I like how it wasn't immediate. No. Like, wow. It was definitely, like, I have to say for a local artist, like, the response I got from the get-go was great because not a lot of people can get that type of traction. Like, I think I had anywhere from, like, I think it was, like, 500 monthly listeners, which was pretty good for, like, my first start. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, okay, that, that gave me the fuel to keep going. Like, okay, like, I have... 500 people monthly that are listening to this, I'm doing something right. right. So, um, as time went on, I started recording more, writing more, and like, I don't know, I, I, I work in marketing, so like, I kind of like to see different trends and what's working for people, and kind of, I take it into my own marketing for my music, mm -hmm. and basically, I was able to apply that, and to my surprise, like, it, my videos started blowing up, right. and I got a lot of traction, and I went from 500 monthly listeners to, I think my top was like 75,000, I'm like, wow. oh my gosh, like this is crazy, like I never thought this could happen for me. And this was all organically? Yes. Okay. I mean, I do know about ads and stuff like that, but in my experience, like, nothing beats organic reach. Like, no, yeah, and it, it's just sometimes working against the algorithms to get it, yes. um, and I think... Your personal story with this is very helpful because a lot of bands actually watch the podcast and it's like, oh, maybe they could pick up some tips and tricks from what you're doing because obviously it worked out in a really good way for you. Yes. Um, I want to backtrack, backtrack to these local bands that you were in. Yes. Like, tell me a little bit about, it was a little bit more pop punky, I think you said? Yeah, it was like pop rock. So basically what happened was I had this friend from School of Rock and she said that um, there was a band that their singer left and they needed a new singer. So... Um, I can't remember the name of it exactly. It, it left me. <laughs> but um, It was never that important. <laughs> it, I mean, actually, it, it was important because it kind of shaped me to want to pursue this big time. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think back when I first joined it, it was kind of like, oh, I love music, I love writing, I love singing, but do I want to pursue this as like a career thing? Mm -hmm. So I really do. I, I appreciate that experience because it has taught me a lot. And um, I think it shaped me into kind of the person I am today. And um, it strengthened my love for music. So basically my friend from school rock was like they needed a singer So I auditioned I got in I joined I think it was like a year or two And then I just nobody was you know how it is with kids like nobody sees eye to eye that Yeah, the deal so I ended up leaving and then a year later. I formed another band I remember that name they were it was called before March <laughs> It was because it formed before March <laughs> yeah, it formed before March. That's literally the reason why we named it before March because we couldn't agree on a name Oh wow! But I love, I love, I love everybody in that band dearly. Like I still talk to a lot of them, and um, 
they're really cool people, some of my good friends. But yeah, we just did that for fun. It was kind of like um, an alternative indie type <laughs> band. It was really neat. Um, and then, like I said, it kind of tapered off from there. Like, right. I think we tried to get the same members. Like we tried to do it again, but with, it was when you compare adulthood and like being a teenager, it's, they're completely different things. Like yeah. everybody has work and college, and it's really hard to get everybody together. So that kind of fell through. And then my thing with the bakery it just kind of ruined things. So right. I had a long hiatus for music. No, and everybody's on, like, different tracks of life, too, yes. because something that you might have been in love with when you were a teenager, it's not the same passion there if it's not really what you're, you know, meant to do. Um, do you think that if you come across the right group of people, are you open to being in an actual band again? Or is it, like, are you just enjoying the solo project and it's like, I think I'm going to stay like this? I mean, I am really enjoying the solo project. That's the thing, because, like, I feel like... Yes, I write lyrics, yes, I write melodies, but I feel like the instrumentals, they just tell a whole different story. That like you can convey a message through instrumentals without even speaking a word. And that's what I love because like it's a lot, there's a lot more that goes into writing the instrumental parts. And that's what I love because when it ties together with the lyrics, it just creates just something so special. And I like to have my hand in writing the instrumental parts. So, I mean, it really just depends. I like where I'm at right now. I might be more open to it in the future, but as of now, I, I really like the process that I have created for myself. I mean, the, um, my band members that are in on Eclipse as a whole project, like they do give me their two cents and they tell me, okay, this would go cool here, or like they, they give me just different ideas and I do listen to their ideas and we collaborate on that, but the just basically the songwriting process, I kind of like to keep it intimate mm -hmm. and keep it about my experiences in life. And You know what I mean? Because I feel like, also, a lot of people, they give me messages and they say, oh, like, this song has helped me through a hard experience in my life, thank you. And it's really cool to see that your suffering wasn't in vain, if that makes sense. Kind of right. like, you went through something and you wrote about it and it touched the lives of somebody else. And right. That's what I like. I just like to just make my lyrics and the instrumentals just convey a message that speaks to people. And that's my process, really. And I just think if I... I don't know if I had you know too many cooks in the kitchen. I just feel like for what I try to do, I just I, I don't think it'll work as well. So right, um, I love it. It's like it's a dictatorship. <laughs> it's like thanks for your suggestion. Moving on. <laughs> like, no, okay. You know exactly how it is. It's just like even like cooking. I don't know about you, but I love to cook. And if there's too many people in that kitchen, it's just it becomes annoying. <laughs> I could burn water if I wanted to. I do not know how to cook, but it, it's with every little thing. And I, I love having a production team and, and people to tell me things because like behind the cameras, like we have my mom, we have Rocio, we have this amazing people that they're looking out for me, but I'm so stubborn. Like this piano has been a, a, a topic for the last couple of weeks. It's like, should we keep it? Should it go? Should we keep it? I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. No, I, I, I really like it. No, but yeah, like having too many cooks into a project that then suddenly turns into something that's not your own. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. And it just, and I think it delays um, the project as well because in my past experiences, like when people don't agree, then it just delays things further. And then like with Unholy, like I was able to just write that, um, collaborate with someone on production. Like that's, that's not that big of a deal. But, and then just release it and it was able to gain traction and then it got gave us further opportunities, so I just feel like this has been working, I might just keep up with it. Yeah, and I've always said that, like, work, I don't know how bands do it, because working creatively with other people is probably the hardest thing, like, if you're a doctor and you work in a team, you know what you have to do, you yes. have that objective, and there's not a lot of ways to do it, you know? Exactly. But creatively, it's like, it's, you all have to be on the same page, so I completely exactly. respect that you want to keep this as a solo, solo project. Um, I'm wondering if people have like messaged you and they're like, hey, do you need a band member after seeing they do. how successful you're, you know, they want to jump onto the, they the wagon. Do, but I currently am not needing any further members. I have um, Khaled on bass. I have Lorenzo on guitar. I have AJ on drums. They're great friends of mine. They're amazing musicians. And I'm so, so lucky to have them involved in this project. Um, Shout out to the musicians. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then what was I going to say about the... The instrumentals. Yes. It reminded me of when I was talking to uh, Andy from Feral Emperor. Andy, we love you. Um, he, that he, they do like shoegazy stuff and they're like, oh, well, you could imagine our music being like a movie soundtrack. Like somebody's getting up and they're going through all the process of their day or whatever. And I think that's what you find in writing your own instrumentals yes. and whatnot. Yes. So that's what excites you about it. Like what story you want to tell with the music alone. Exactly. Oh. I know um, even if you listen to instrumental music, like you can kind of 
hear like a mood or like I don't know about you but like you could like envision a color like that's it, kind of how it is when I listen to instrumentals so I like to craft those myself and um, the lyrics as well I just kind of like having full control of that because I don't know everything I write is very vulnerable to about like real experiences in my life whether it be relationship mental illness stuff like that I just like to cover those topics and if I'm writing something so personally, I kind of like the instrumentals to also convey that message. I've been, I've been shit on for not listening to instrumentals. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I'm a, I'm a very big vocals person. Like yes. to me, like the vocals and the lyrics and what they're saying, that's the kind, that's how the music reaches me. Yes. And I think that's the difference about someone who like really knows about music as to someone who like really just listens to it for, you know, for fun or because I like it. Um, but I, I am a huge I'm a huge vocals person. <laughs> I think I would be too, but my mom had me grow up on just like classical music at night. And I feel like it just, as I got older, like it, it never left me. Like at night, this is so funny. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this on an interview, but I cannot go to sleep without listening to classical music. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy because like, there's times where I, like, I have to stay in hotels and stuff like that. And I just don't get a good night's sleep because my classical music is not on. Like, it's funny because um, I took a trip with my sister and her boyfriend like a couple months ago and I just felt so embarrassed. Like, I didn't want to put the classical music on. But like, that's the way I fall asleep every night. <laughs> oh my gosh. But that's... <laughs> I mean, to some extent, I think that might, uh, there has to be some sort of study out there that's like, oh, this yeah. helps your sleep quality I or something. Because it it, it's uh, classical music does something very different to people. I mean, you're not going to sleep listening to like freaking, I don't know, it's a heavy band. I can't think of one right now. <laughs> <laughs> something really yelly, like it's Lamb of God. God. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're not going to sleep listening to Lamb of God. You know, you're, you're something that trains the brain. Exactly. And that's so cool, though. I mean, when I was a kid, I, and I, like, I loved music my whole life, but I went through a very big senora phase at like 12, um, and I would go to sleep listening to like Laura Pausini, like belting out vocals, and I'm like, oh my god, if you've never listened, Laura Pausini is an Italian artist, okay. um, but she sings in Spanish, she calls herself the most Latin Italian, and she is an amazing composer, singer, artist in general, but she's had some iconic songs in the Latin world since... I was a kid. I used to listen to like stuff like that going to sleep. It's like, how did you even sleep? You have this lady yeah. screaming in your ear. <laughs> I literally, if, if something's too loud, like it can't be too loud either. Like it, it'll just throw me off, but it has to be just the right volume. So I don't know how you were doing that. Because, no, oh I, my gosh. I don't either. I was like 12 I'm such a going through singer. the biggest heartbreak of my life, right? Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> this is the love of my life. It's just a dude. <laughs> it's a kid. Um, <laughs> But anyways, what were some of your, well, aside from the classical music, what were some of your influences growing up? Um, did you have like a scene emo phase? Oh my God. I feel like I'm still in it. <laughs> it never, it's not a phase. It's, it's, it's never going to leave me. I just think as the older you get, like the more fabulous it gets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just evolves over time. Right. Like now we can actually go to a salon and dye our hair funky <laughs> colors and not like splat dye it at home, you know? Oh, I'm lucky because my sister's a hairdresser, so I get this done for free. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, growing up, definitely, like, I, I have a love for all different types of music. Literally everything. Like, people are like, oh, how do you like country? Like, I, I like country, like rap, I love rock, metal, all that. Like, I, I just, I feel like my parents have, they have such a, a different, diverse taste, and I just kind of adopted it. So growing up, uh, my mom was more of, like, the grungy type. So, like, I grew up on Nirvana a lot. I love Nirvana. Like, they're definitely probably a band that has shaped me and kind of gotten me into music in the first place. And then, um, I know this is funny, but, like, I'm an emo Swifty. Um, growing up, when I was like 12, like I, <laughs> I loved Taylor Swift. I still do. I still think she's so creative, and I talk, I call myself like the Taylor Swift of rock music in this scene because I rate everything about like real experiences. And it's funny because like she actually has kind of shaped my songwriting, and she's so vulnerable in her lyrics, and it, it kind of like I've been writing lyrics like since I was like 10 years old. So mm -hmm. like hearing her and her experiences like it kind of inspired me. So. She's another person that has inspired me. Um, I know, um, of course, I was in that emo phase, Pierce the Veil. Bring Me the Horizon really is a huge inspiration to me. Um, not just like the band themselves, but I, even like the instru in instrumentalization. Like, I really like the way they pair synths with the guitars and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And I kind of try to adopt a little bit of that style. Um, the bite Back is heavily influenced by Bring the Horizon. Um, I, like the I can song. see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the newest song I released um, back in October. Um, but yes, Pierce the Bell, Sleeping the Sirens, Bring on the Horizon is a huge one. Um, I know I was also a big Lana girl growing up when I was like 13, 14. Who Lana wasn't? Ray. She's amazing. She I, was so talented. Like, she is so talented. I kind of fell off the Lana train a while ago, but yeah. uh, 
probably like when Summertime Sadness got so overplayed on the radio, oh gosh, and that was just like, I'm, I'm kind of tired of this. <laughs> but Lana was huge, yeah, yeah, 100% for the Tumblr girls. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, and as I got like a little older, then I started listening to like heavier stuff, like like Slipknot and all that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, that kind of shaped... All of it kind of shaped my sound. I know I even take influences from like modern rap and stuff like that. Like, and Holy has kind of like a trap intro. Like, I basically I have so much love and appreciation for so many types of genres of music that I just wanted to implement implement it into my project. And you could see that I only have three songs out, so it's kind of I don't know. It's kind of hard to see right now, but like I have a ton more dropping this year, and you can see like my love for. All these different types of genres. I mean, I don't want to be all over the place either, but you you see what I mean. Just kind of. Well, then it's it's funny it how you're like mentioning that because it's like yeah, you are showing the love for the different types of music, but it's all still very cohesive. Yes. Like it is under one project, and it's not like I listen to it and it's like okay, this should be you know under another name. It it all makes sense. Yes. Um. That you mentioned that you're an emo Swifty. I don't know if you've seen it, but on TikTok there's this people that do like <laughs> a, a punk covers of Taylor Swift, oh, like pop yes, punk covers. I've seen so good yes, <laughs> like definitely. and i think that shows taylor's versatility as a songwriter too that like it works with different genres country taylor will forever be my favorite taylor uh, yeah I, I i have to disagree with you though i really like the um reputation era t um taylor like just like the revengeful taylor that was that's like kind of like what i'm trying to do with my own project right and i really like that because it was like a complete shift like it was really cool like she laid low for a couple years and then she came back with that it was I, really that's the cool. thing, and I think it's because she laid low that I fell off the Swifty train. Like, it's yeah. not, I'm not going to say I'm a, not a fan. Like, I, I love her music, and yeah. I think she's great, but it's not like a, I've consistently been there. So after that, I guess, lay low era, I probably have to, like, the Kanye thing? I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that was a big moment in her career, unfortunately. But, um, no, I, the, the country Taylor for me, it, like, it just hits so different. And it shows how, like, even as a kid, she was so talented yes. also i love how her and Haley williams are friends oh definitely like definitely. power and you both started off around like the same age like that's insane to me but um i i see your influences i really like it like it, it's something different it, it strays away and you're not like enclosing yourself in the genre box no i mean if you look at my spotify right now like you're gonna see all these different things and people are gonna be like what like <laughs> And then on top of it off, I listen to classical music at night, so I, I, I just have to say, like, I'm a complete music lover, like, I don't think there's, like, a genre that, like, I wouldn't give a chance, you know what I mean? Like, I just feel like growing up on all these different types of, like, hearing all these different types of music, like, from my dad, my mom, like, they're two very different people. I feel like it's really shaped my love for music, so. Your dad got the goth girl. I'm just not yeah, realizing. Yeah, he did, he did. Yeah. He, did. <laughs> he was I, the normie that got the goth girl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Is there any genre that you have listened to that you're like, nope, absolutely not for me? I don't know. I feel like I'm pretty open. Right. There's nothing that you've listened to. You're just like, never mind. Nope. Not down um, this. I mean, it would have to be like right in front of my face to kind of, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I can't really think of anything off the top of my head. But I'm gonna say no. I feel like I'm really open. Did you even go through that dubstep era? I did. Like, scary yeah. monsters I and did. bright stars. Yeah. All that. <laughs> Yeah, so I just have to say, like, I don't think there's, like, anything that I wouldn't give a chance. Is there anything that you've gone back and listened to now that you're like, this is actually shit. Like, this was not good. <laughs> um, maybe some stuff during, like, my emo phase. Just really, um, depends. Like, just, there's some songs that are, like, really whiny. Yeah. I'm like, why did I like this? <laughs> you know what I mean? I love whiny <laughs> pop punk. Yeah, not that. Like, there's just, like, you know, like, when they try to combine, like, the... I don't know how to describe it, but like the scene music where yeah. <laughs> they have like the the um like the techno type of music and like the guitars and it was just, it was just all over the place like like not... a broken side yeah kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that that counts so, yeah I, out of all the stuff and I've said this and it still pains me to say it on camera but like <laughs> I used to listen to Blood on a Dance floor. oh no. And it was one of those things that when I went back as an adult and I was like, let me check this out. It's so bad. Like, just, it's just genuinely bad. Or like songs with really suggestive lyrics. Like, I'm sorry, like, you're you're an artist. Feel free to talk about whatever you want. But when I was like 13, 14 listening to some of this stuff, like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that happened to me with, well, the stuff, obviously by the time I listened to Blood on Dance Floor, I knew what things like that were. But yeah. as a kid, listening to Top 40 radio yes. and stuff, no, none of that was appropriate. <laughs> like, absolutely none of it. I know. And a lot of the Spanish songs I used to listen to as a kid, too, right now, it's like, 
absolutely <laughs> not. Like, what was I? Hello. <laughs> it's funny because like I don't speak Spanish, but my boyfriend does, and he decodes like all these lyrics for me. He's like, oh, it sounds so good, and like just like like so danceable, but like you gotta know what they're talking about. And, like I'm just sitting there, like, are you serious? <laughs> No, you translate it, like, even nowadays, like, it's, it's, it's all very, like, a lot of the popular mainstream stuff is just very dirty. Like, Bad Bunny, like, you cannot play half of that crap at a family gathering. It's like, eh. um, it, it was actually funny, on Christmas, I was playing some, like, the Christmas tree has a Bluetooth speaker, so I was playing music through there, but I was playing, like, my reggaeton playlist, and at some point, my mom was like, eh, skip that one, please. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, that's not appropriate. That's so funny. <laughs> But anyways, we got sidetracked. For, for Ana Eclipse, what is your goal with this project? Like, where do you want to see yourself in a while? Or um, Honestly, things are picking up really fast. Um, I don't know what to expect. Um, I have to say, like, I've met a lot of my goals already. Um, mm-hmm. It's crazy because these are things that I thought I'd seen be five years down the line, not the first year. So right. I really just have so many people to thank, just the people that enjoy my music and the people that support me, like, I wouldn't be anywhere without them. So I really appreciate the people that listen to my music and enjoy it. Um, as far as goals, really, I just want to write songs that speak to people. Um, I know I like, I want to write some more songs um, kind of on, like, mental health awareness, just mm-hmm. because it's a big part of my life. Um, I know Kill Me Slow, it, it, there's a lot of metaphors in it, and some people say they get it, some people say they don't. Um, basically, I'm personifying the dis- like a, a, a disorder that I have. And um, basically, a lot of people have come to me and they say, like, oh, this song has really helped me, thank you. And even Unholy, like, oh, I got out of this toxic relationship and this song helped me during the breakup. So basically, I just want to keep writing some more vulnerable stuff that helps people during dark and tough times because I was that person too. And I still am. Whenever I'm going through something, I find an artist that wrote something that speaks to me. It's very comforting and I just want to be that comfort to others. So that's just a goal of mine to just release more music and just be a voice for people that are going through hard times because music has always been there for me and it's a very therapeutic thing um but as far as like other goals in general i mean i don't know where this year is going to take me things are great things are this is like a complete blessing i have to say because i just i never when i first released unholy like i didn't think any of of this would happen like yes i have like some marketing knowledge and stuff like that but i didn't think it was going to get me to this point right you know what i mean like this is it's getting big like i'm headed in a really positive direction yeah um, i've had some really exciting emails that i can't talk about um, all good. <laughs> and also i'm i can't talk about the show announcement but this really amazing artist that i look up to invited me to play on their show next month so i'm gonna announce that soon but yes that's what's gonna happen this, this comes out february oh this goes oh okay yeah, oh, yeah. yeah so yeah. this month <laughs> <laughs> yes so if you want to say it it's also will not be aired until february 3rd <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. awesome yeah, so this month, um, a artist that I look up to has invited me to join the lineup of their show, so I'm really, really excited, but I can't announce it just yet. Is it a local or is it a... a... No, not local, not local. Big artist. Uh, but yeah, bigger artist. How exciting! <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very, very excited that they considered me for this show. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna see where life takes me. This has all been so amazing, so honestly, I'm just gonna try to shoot for the stars what's your oh, like if you shoot for the stars what's that star what's your biggest dream what's your dream stage or tour or something oh my gosh like i'm a huge spirit box fan okay. i am like ugh, courtney she... <laughs> i mean if we tour with spirit box that would be like a dream come true bring me the horizon oh my god I- i'd pass out like, right <laughs> i feel like touring with someone that like i look up to would probably be like one of like it's definitely on my bucket list for sure right like and even i think like getting to that point as well being like as influential as they are like that would be like my ultimate goal right um but like i said i'm just gonna see where life takes me you know like what i'm experiencing right now is it's been amazing like more than i could ever ask for right and even as you put out more music it's like you can still be that person obviously like bigger bands have done it for the masses like for me like my band that's always been there has been pierce the veil like for me like those lyrics, I could cry like yeah. <laughs> listening to them. Um, I've seen them so many times live. Like they're, and I hate that they blew up so much that like you can't even find tickets anymore. So it's like, dude, I saw them back at Warp Tour. Like, come on, they, they were they were always my thing. It's crazy because my fifteenth birthday, I will remember this to the day I die. <laughs> but my parents got me tickets to see Pierce the Veil. I think it was at the, um, the 
Fillmore, Miami? Like, uh-huh. And um, I just remember it just being just like an intimate show. Like, it wasn't anything too crazy. Like, I was able, it was Sleeping on the Sirens, Pierce the Veil, and Paris. Yeah, and dream lineup. <laughs> it was a dream lineup. And it was just such a great show because it wasn't too crowded. Like, I was at a really good spot. Like, the tickets were a decent price. Like, yeah, yeah. It was honestly, like, my dream show. Like, it, it, was, it was probably the best show I've ever been to. Right. But it's so sad because, like, nowadays, like, that can't happen. Even Chase Atlantic, it's crazy because they blew up so much. I don't know if you, if you know who they are. I have, like, one song by them that always pops up on my playlist. Yeah. Um, I can't even remember the name of it right now. But, yeah, I, I, I like them. They're good. <laughs> Literally, when I tell you, like... Five years ago, I went to their show at the Kelsey Theater. I don't know if that's still a thing anymore. It's in um, Lake Park. It's I'm from like West Palm Beach area, yeah. so it's way different than down here. But like, um, it's just like this little venue. And when I went to their show, like, I want to say most the most people I've seen were like 15 in the crowd. Like when I say like 15 individual people, like yeah. I was literally like I could reach out and touch them. Right. That's how close I was. That's so cool. But now like. I went to their show like a couple years ago and it was packed. Like, yeah. and I can only imagine how it is now. So it's really, really nice to see artists flow up and that's so great for them. But it's just also sad for us too because like, oh, I'd love to experience something like that again. But I feel very fortunate because like those few artists that I've been to their concert and it was just like a very intimate, nice show. Like, I got to, I got to experience that before they blew up. So yeah. It was really, really neat. It's fun to be like, I was at day one. Yeah. Like, and, 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 well, I actually got to see Pierce Seville did like this uh, media tour where they went to the the shark stations oh, no and had a friend that works there. And he always told me, he was like, oh, if you want to um, go to any of the shows, just let me know. You could get in. There's no issue. So I got to go see them in an intimate setting like last year. <laughs> and they played five acoustic songs, like a acoustic-ish session. It was magical. Like they do not lose their magic. They played some of the songs that they haven't played on stage in a while either. Like it was amazing. But it is nice to be like, I'm, you know, they're my day one. Yeah. But as you keep putting out more music, like it might not, like, for now, it might not be for, you know, stadiums, but you're still going to reach those people and have them be your comfort music. Exactly, exactly. And like right now, it's just something incredible. Like I, I'm honestly, I'm just living in the present because it's just something I never thought I would achieve, especially this fast. So I'm incredibly thankful and I'm just really excited to share more music. That's something that I'm so excited to do this year. It's funny too, because uh, with the previous guest, we were just talking off camera about how like sometimes people can be so intimidating and yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like I thought you were going to be intimidating no, 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 no. and I love seeing how grateful and nice you are. And, and it's, I'm happy that something good is happening to a good person, you know, Thank like you. I feel your vibe and I'm like, oh my God, you deserve this and more. I'm like a golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. It's like, she looks like, like an angry dog, like a German shepherd, <laughs> but it's giving golden retriever. <laughs> No, but for real, congratulations. I actually mean it. Like, I can't wait to see you grow. Thank you. Um, Before we jump into the relationship question, I do want to just concisely, any marketing tips that you could give to other artists or musicians, where would you tell them to start? Just so help them maybe with the algorithm, something that you've noticed works for you. Definitely. Okay, so basically, um, this is aside from marketing, but this is just the number one, honestly, to believe in yourself. Because there's been times where people have told me something like, oh, your lyrics are too simple, or oh, they're too hard to code. And at that point, like, which one is it then? You know what I mean? So you can't write music to please people. That's number one. Because I think that was another big part of my problem. Um, When I was first starting out, I just was spending a long time thinking, oh my gosh, like, what do I release first? Like, are people going to like it? And I was worried what people were going to think of me when I should have been worried about what do I think of me? What do I think of this song? So that's a question to ask yourself. Do you enjoy the music you're creating? Is it um, authentic to you? And that's something I asked myself before I released Unholy. And it's funny because people are always going to have a different perception of your art, but you have to keep in mind that it's your art. It's nobody else's art. Like they could take whatever they want from it. They could love. They could love it. They could hate it. But at the end of the day, of the day you're sharing an experience um, from your life, and you're sharing a piece of yourself. So that's like the number one thing in my mind is just to be true to yourself. Release what you want, and don't think about what others think about you. Don't don't think about people judging you. Because mm-hmm. that was something huge. Because like I had like experiences in the past, like with people just. You know how it is growing up and like people say shitty things and And then you have your insecurities forever in your little backpack. Exactly. Yeah. It sticks with you and you're like, oh, I'm not good enough. I don't know. But I just, I feel like you should just just ignore that voice in your head that's telling you you're not good enough because you never know what's going to come of it. Like I literally did not think this would happen to me. So, um, but as far as marketing, really just stay on top of trends. Just see what people are doing, see what's working for them. And there's tons of trends on TikTok. I, I really like TikTok to market. Like I'm really, I like to stay mysterious on other platforms. Like 
here's the thing, like for the, for the type of music I'm doing in my persona, my artistic persona, um, I can't really go crazy on, on Instagram, Facebook, all that, but TikTok, I'm just unhinged on TikTok. <laughs> There's sometimes where I bully myself on TikTok. Like, it's, right. just, it's just kind of like, you can do that on TikTok. Right. So I basically, um, Gen Z is feral. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Honestly, I just think also staying um, consistent works as well. So not only just seeking out the trends, but I like to post like three times a day. Okay. And it, it seems to work. Um, I know for other people it's different, but that's just what has worked for me. Um, and if you can, just utilize all the platforms, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, like just basically take the same video and just upload it everywhere. Um, like I said, I can't really do that because like I'm trying to keep more of a mysterious artistic persona. Yeah. Um, but for everybody, like for anybody that, like, that's in a different genre or like doesn't really care like it they could apply it to right you know what i mean yeah so basically that's what i do for on my marketing side okay. um, but really like the best thing to do is just stay true to yourself and another thing is invest in your art too um, i honestly think releasing a quality for a single has helped me immensely mm -hmm. like i didn't want to spend money on like a quality mixing and mastering engineer but i really think it has helped a lot because that's like the like the first impression of me is oh wow like it's it's really good quality and mm -hmm. i feel like that has helped me grow too because people hear me, that my first single and they expect like oh like the next one's gonna be like even better you know right because i was gonna release like a demo first and then i told myself you know what let me just wait let me let me wait till i get some more money and like put more invest more into a, a good mixing and mastering engineer so i really think investing in your art helps as well okay so we'll take that invest in it and post a lot don't be so worried <laughs> about like curating the perfect content Especially on a platform like TikTok, oh, that's definitely a lot yeah. more organic. I love that. Okay, we'll jump into the relationship Reddit post. <laughs> okay. My boyfriend of three plus years doesn't want to leave his parents to marry me. They are both 26 and he has lived with his parents his entire life. They are rich and he doesn't have any responsibilities around the house. He works at his father's company. They have been friends since 2020 and they started going out in 2021. Uh, and when it got serious, you know, she's met the family multiple times. They've gone on vacation with them and everything. They don't want me because I'm poor and ugly. <laughs> I live with my mom and we are middle class. The flat is ours and we don't have to pay rent and we both work, you know, um, and his dad wants him to marry somebody rich. They plan to get married around 27. Uh, but when I told him that, he says that it's too early and if it was up to him, he would get married at 30. I told him we plan to get married at 27. We're already 26. He said, I said that because you wanted to. Uh, he's too comfy and does not want to move out of his parents' grasp. She is really sad and doesn't know what to do. What advice could you give her? Oh my gosh. Okay, so from what I'm seeing is it just seems like this man is very immature. Um, I can understand, like, not wanting to get married right away. Like, I, I get that. Um, but at the same time, it really seems like he's really comfortable living with his rich parents. And he might be the type that isn't a hard worker and likes to just be taken care of. Um, so in my experience, <laughs> I'd probably just walk away now. Like, I, I wouldn't just walk, I'd run away. <laughs> <laughs> like, run, please. <laughs> I mean, it's so sad, but, like, it's true. Like, you need to, especially, like, someone that is, their parents are saying that, like, if you're with this person, you love this person, stand up for them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is, like, this is your girlfriend. What are you doing? This is not saying anything. Like, and I think that translates from the fact that he hasn't had to work hard both like in life and yeah. probably on his relationships yeah so it's like oh they could just say whatever they want or we can get married whenever and it's not something like so serious to him i guess as to someone who's like been working hard their whole life and probably just want to work towards having a family and whatnot it's like bro <laughs> yeah a deal breaker for me too is like if a family member or like parent says something and they kind of like either silently agree or like don't stand up for you like i feel like that's a huge deal breaker yeah you know especially if they called it they called her ugly and poor like are you serious i would have oh, i, I would have been so mad yeah i, I would have left yeah like the second i hear ugly and poor we're, we're done <laughs> <laughs> unless you're gonna play for the plastic surgery <laughs> yeah, right, right? oh my gosh all right, Anna, if you have any messages, this is your shameless plug moment. Go ahead and let that camera know anything you need them to know about your project. I just really want to thank Vicky for having me. Thank you so much. You this has out. been great just talking about everything. And I really just, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you guys so much for listening to my music and just m getting me to where I am today. Because without you guys, like, I would be nothing. You know what I mean? Like, I'd, I'd probably just be working towards that bakery. Cool. <laughs> So thank you so much for sharing my music and just giving me support, all your positive messages. They've really impacted my life. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Again, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Congratulations. Keep working hard towards your goals. I love your philosophy as a musician. And thank you for coming out to the podcast. We will catch you guys on another episode next week. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, engage, repost, share, tell your friends, go out to shows. And that's about it. We'll see you next Saturday.